your Locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 672 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. Big, big day today. We've got three days worth of Rangers training camp to discuss. We've also uh, got some interesting comments from our Temi Panarin regarding his playoff performance from this past season. And speaking of Panarin, he apparently has taken Vitaly Krasov under his wing a little bit. It sounds like you know, if these uh, early line combinations are to be believed, it seems uh, not certain, but perhaps likely that Panarin and Kravtsov and Vincent Trocek, that'll be your number two line to start the season. That's at least what we're seeing uh, in the early portions of training camp here. So we're going to talk about all that. We've also uh, got the uh, battle for the sixth defenseman spot that continues. And uh, of course, the Rangers play hockey tonight. Yes, it is the preseason. Yes, the lineup tonight is going to look a lot different from how it'll look on opening night, but it is still Rangers hockey. It's still Madison Square Garden. It's still Rangers Islanders, and I cannot freaking wait uh, to watch this game tonight. So I figure, once again, we don't have any time to waste here. Let's jump right into this Artemi Panarin interview. Uh, He met with the media a little bit. He admitted that he lost some of his confidence in the Stanley Cup playoffs this past year, and it Definitely looked that way to me, I'm sure to a lot of you as well. You know, this is not a guy that tends to be lacking in the confidence department. So to see him struggle as badly as he did in the playoffs with turnovers and just randomly losing control of the puck, uh, just making blind backhand passes to nobody and just being uh, generally indecisive, it was very striking to to watch that happen to the point that I think a lot of us kind of just assumed that He was playing injured, but unless they've kept that completely under wraps, it does not sound like that was the case at all. Panarin was just going through a rough, a rough stretch at uh, you know, the worst possible time, that being the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, The point that I made though in Panarin's defense, and I'll continue to throw this out there from time to time, but Panarin, everything that happened in the playoffs last year, it also just goes to show you how good of a player he really is. I know some fans were very frustrated with the way that he played. I was at times too, but. Uh, This guy, at his absolute worst, still ends up with 16 points in 20 playoff games, and that includes a Game 7 overtime winner. That's his floor. That's as bad as it can possibly get for Artemi Panarin. So imagine uh, how good he can be in the playoffs if he's playing at his best. And as I mentioned, you know, he met with the media. He had an interpreter there, was discussing his playoff performance. He was mentioning that uh, he wants to bring back the game that he played with uh, for the first two years, well, the only two years that he spent with the Columbus Blue Jackets, and then also the way he played the first year on the Rainers, where there's more movement and more of a puck game. Uh, This is what he had to say about that. I really need to start being everywhere and doing everything. Uh, He also talked about how, you know, this past year he played what he thought was too simple of a game, you know, basically just kind of throwing the puck down the boards every time he got the blue line. And uh, he mentioned that a change of style will help him progress and it'll make it more difficult for the opponent to figure out what the Rangers are about to do. And he also mentioned, and this is big too, that it'll help his teammates. And a quote from Panarin there was, my teammates weren't developing as much as they should be. And he put kind of put that on himself there, you know, just not setting them up for success the way that he can. And, you know, he's got an opportunity to do that this season. I mean, certainly, if he's playing with Vincent Trocek, you know, Trocek should get a bump from playing with Panarin like most players do. Uh, but Trocek's a pretty established player in this league. I mean, you pretty much know what you're going to get from him. But the guy that he can really, really help, once again, if they stick with this trio going into the season, that would be Vitaly Kravtsov. And we're going to talk about uh, Panarin and his relationship with Kravtsov and how he's kind of been helping him out a little bit thus far in the training camp. I do have to mention this, though. Panarin, during this interview, the shirt he was wearing was just absolutely ridiculous. He's got uh, a shirt of himself, like a cartoon drawing of himself, uh, saying Jacob Jacob. You know, obviously a reference to uh, the congratulatory video that he sent to Jacob Truba when Truba was named the captain uh, during this offseason, just, you know, a couple weeks ago. And he was also asked during this interview uh, why he thinks Jacob Truba was the right choice. And for most of this interview, everything that I talked about just a second ago, uh, he did it with the assistance of an interpreter. But when he was asked this question, uh, why do you think Jacob is the right choice? He said, because I don't speak English, which is quite possibly the most Artemi Panarin answer that I've ever heard. He was obviously joking, but uh, it was definitely a funny moment there. 
But as far as, you know, Panarin and his relationship with Kravtsov, um, you know, got a couple of different things to talk about here. For starters, uh, they're looking pretty good on the ice together by most accounts. And again, I'm not at all these practices, the training camp and what have you. I'm just going by articles that are written, tweets that are sent out. That That's pretty much what you have to go by if you're not actually in attendance. But the general consensus seems to be that the Panarin, Trocek, and Kravtsov line has been quite possibly the best Ranger line thus far in the training camp, which is obviously very nice to hear because none of these three players have ever played with each other in the past. I mean, maybe Panarin and Kravtsov, you know, Kravtsov played 20 games with the Rangers, um, you know, not last year, but the season before. I'm sure they were on the ice together at a certain time here and there, but not much experience. And beyond that, yeah, no experience uh, as far as this trio is concerned, them all playing together. So to hear that, you know, they're already gelling and uh, off to a strong start. Very, very encouraging to hear. Uh, we also got a tweet from a friend of the show, Vince Mercagliano. This is what he had to say about, you know, Panarin and Trocek. Multiple times per day so far in this camp, I've noticed Panarin talking to Kravtsov or pulling him aside for extra work. There's obviously a level of comfort because they speak the same language, but it seems like Panarin is taking a special interest and leadership role with him. And yeah, I mentioned that not too long ago that, you know, Panarin and Kravtsov being from the same country, there's obviously some common ground there. And maybe, you know, we were talking about the line combinations and, you know, I was kind of hoping that we'd get, you know, Lafreniere on the top line, Kako on the second line. Doesn't look like that's going to be the case, at least right out of the gate here. They're going to keep the kid line together. You'll have Blay on the top line. You'll have uh, Kravtsov on the second line. But maybe part of the reason for that is that Kravtsov is more comfortable with Panarin than anybody else. Kravtsov could kind of use a little bit of a boost, a little bit of a jolt, and obviously playing with Artemi Panarin, it's a tremendous opportunity for him. Being in the top six in general, uh, you know, for somebody who refused to essentially play for the Rangers organization, play for the Wolfpack last season, is now into a top six role and, and a tremendous opportunity in front of him. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting to see how this whole thing shakes out. Uh, Kravtsov himself also spoke with the media for the first time, and this is what he had to say. It sounds like he's had some time to do a little bit of self-reflection here. I mean, you have to figure that at a certain point last year, you know, the Rangers, they're having this great season, and then they make the playoffs, and then they come back from 3-1 against the Penguins. They get the Game 7 overtime winner there. You play the, the Hurricanes tooth and nail, you know, just a toe-to-toe -to -toe slugfest of a series. The Rangers win Game 7 on the road there. They're playing the Lightning in the Eastern Conference Final. At some point, Krasov had to look at this and think like, man, I, I, I really should be over there. Like, I, I, I messed up. I would have to think that at some point, it's just human nature. You know, and even if you think you were right, you're convinced you were right, and the Rangers were in the wrong to send you to the Wolf Pack. At a certain point, you probably think to yourself like, man, I should have just gone to the minors, probably got another chance, and I could be part of this. So that's what I like to think happened. And if you go by what Krasov said here, it sounds like something along those lines is sort of what transpired, uh, you know, within the uh, brain of Vitaly Krasov over the past year or so here. But this is what he had to say. He was also using a Russian translator. I definitely made a lot of noise previously. So there's kind of this necessity to redeem myself. It's more about putting in the work. It's not what anybody says. And then he went on to say, after I left last year, I talked with Chris Drury all of the season. I talked with all of the guys. What happens on the internet is not always the truth about what's happening in the locker room. And he went on to mention at a certain point that about 85% of what was said about him on the internet was not true. And, you know, again, it's it's easy to draw conclusions. And I think, you know, Krasov was in the wrong for how he handled his demotion for, to, to the AHL this past season. Uh, but be that as it may, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some things that get said that aren't necessarily true. We're not privy to everything that happens be, behind closed doors. And so, yeah, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there's more to the story than a lot of us probably realize. But Krasov also mentioned that, you know, he needed to focus on his mental health. He did that this past year. And uh, to do so, he entirely avoided social media, which is probably not a bad idea for anybody to take a break from social media, at least from time to time. Uh, this is what Artemi Panarin had to say about the relationship as well. We mostly talk about minor corrections and suggestions during the game. Our shifts have definitely gone very well, and our focus is just going to be to try to maintain that level. And then, uh, you know, one more thing. I'll, I'll give you one more quote from Kravtsov here that he said uh, during the... Uh, the portion of uh, uh, media scrum, I don't know what to call it, but the bottom line is that the media members were all talking to Vitaly Kravtsov. And this is what he had to say about, you know, the entire situation with the Rangers. The guys respect me. I'm accepted. I know that everything really depends on what I do on my work. 
And I think that's very indicative of, you know, the strength of the Ranger locker room. We talked about this all throughout last year, the team chemistry on this team and, and just how much guys genuinely seem to like each other and to play hard for each other. I mean, it's through the roof. It's not always like this. We've seen Ranger teams where, you know, I think back to that very late 90s and early 2000s era where it seemed like there was some talent and they had some big names on the team, but nothing ever gelled, nothing ever really came together, and they missed the playoffs for however long it was, like seven straight years, eight straight years, I think, if you count the uh, the lockout season. But uh, yeah, I mean, this team, this locker room is very strong, and I think that Vitaly Kravtsov being back in there is not going to you know, throw everything for a loop, and it sounds like just the opposite has happened. It sounds like if you go by what Kravtsov said here, the guys have been very welcoming of him, willing to give him a second chance and uh, you know, get to work with him and uh, hopefully put him in a position to succeed. There's a heck of a redemption story here if it plays out you know, the way that Rain the Rangers themselves and the Ranger fans would like to see it play out. That's what's fascinating about this whole situation to me. With Kravtsov, this thing could still play out one of about 100 different ways. We, we could see a situation where Kravtsov is on the Rangers for the next decade in a top six role and becomes an excellent player, becomes Artemi Panarin's right-hand man. Those two make magic together, and he turns into a heck of a player. There's also another scenario where, you know, three games into the season, Gallant decides he wants to drop Kravtsov from the second line to the fourth line, and Kravtsov leaves the ice and never comes back. I mean, literally everything is on the table. Any Either of those two extremes or anything in between honestly could happen. And I'm at the point with Kravtsov where nothing at all is going to surprise me. And we'll see how the whole thing shakes out. It's a very curious storyline to follow. And um, fingers crossed that everything remains harmonious between Kravtsov and the Rangers. And we get, you know, a surprisingly strong season from Kravtsov. He has a chance to be a big time X factor on this team. But we got three days worth of scrimmages to talk about. Also got to talk about uh, the game against the Islanders tonight. And we will do all that in just a second. But first, just want to let everybody know, today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I use Athletic Greens every day. I started taking it because I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great, and I wanted to see what all the hype was about. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you are absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. It costs you less than $3 a day, you're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. All right, so I wanted to go ahead and turn our attention to the scrimmages. The Rangers uh, scrimmaged and practiced on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. On Friday, the first goal of the scrimmage was scored by the undrafted Sam Alfano because, of course, uh, Alfano, an 18-year-old right winger who had 25 points in 65 games with the Petersboro, excuse me, Peterboro Peets of the OHL this past season. Uh, despite the goal, Alfano was one of four players that the Rangers trimmed from their training camp roster on Saturday. Uh, Alfano was one of them. The other three were 2021 third-round center Jaden Grub, 2022 fifth-round left winger Maxim Barbashev, and 2022 third-round center Bryce McConnell-Barker. Really no surprises here. I mean, these guys are going to be all returning to their respective juniors teams. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention there is that Jaden Grub actually scored a goal on Friday as well. Uh, this will definitely interest a lot of Ranger fans. We got a defenseman pairing of Braden Schneider and everyone's favorite, Libor Hayek. And it's funny because I had a chance to think a little bit more about this, you know, over the weekend. Obviously, you know, recording my first episode here since I think Thursday. Friday's episode was recorded on, on Thursday. So I've had some time to think about this. And I started asking myself, like, am I being a little bit too hard? Are we all, as Ranger fans, collectively being a little too tough on Libor Hayek? I mean, he is just 24 years old. He's had 
94 NHL games, which is not what I would call a small sample size, but it's not a ton of games either. It's a season and a little bit of change. Uh, you know, I've stood up for other young players in the past on this podcast. So should I be a little bit more receptive to Libor Hayek getting this opportunity? But there's something that I really didn't think about, like I said, until this weekend. And it's the reason why I don't think I'm being too unfair here toward Libor Hayek. Think about this, okay? The Rangers, this past season in the playoffs, they played 20 playoff games. Let's examine that third defense pairing, okay? Braden Schneider played all 20 games which is a good thing because he was the best option and he was out there for every single game that the Rangers played in the playoffs. Justin Braun played 19 games of the 20 for the Rangers. Also a good thing. I think he was the best option for that sixth spot uh, for this team in the playoffs last year. Patrick Nemeth played five playoff games for the Rangers this past season, which is five games too many for Patrick Nemeth. And Libor Hayek was never even really considered an option I mean, he was the eighth defenseman at best, even behind Patrick Nemeth, who, let's be honest here, was just flat out bad in the playoffs. There was even a game where the Rangers dressed seven defensemen, and the reason that they did this was because Ryan Lindgren was just back from an injury, and they didn't know for sure that he was going to be able to make it through the whole game, and so they dressed seven defensemen because you don't want to have Lindgren get hurt and then have to go with five defensemen for the last two and a half periods or whatever it would have been. Uh, so they dressed seven defensemen, and Hayek was not one of them. Patrick Nemeth was the seventh defenseman. He did not play the entire game until just 15 seconds remained. Uh, he played the final 15 seconds after the Rangers scored an empty netter. But, you know, Libor Hayek was not out there. The Rangers dressed seven defensemen. They actually did that a couple of times. Patrick Nemeth was the seventh. Libor Hayek apparently did not even get any consideration. And again, we don't know everything that goes on behind closed doors. Maybe Libor Hayek did get some consideration to being the seventh defenseman in this game. Maybe he even got some consideration to playing a different playoff game. We don't know that for sure. But you didn't really hear his name very often. And as far as I could tell, you know, I'm not sure Gerard Gallant said his name a single time the entire postseason run. So think about this. We've gone from a situation where Hayek has gone from not even good enough to be considered to pass Patrick Nemeth in the pecking order to a situation where, okay, he's good enough to have the upper hand on both Zach Jones and Matthew Robertson. Keep in mind, only a couple of months have gone by. You know, the Rangers were playing in the playoffs just a couple of months ago. So that is quite the turnaround in just a couple of months here. Not good enough to even warrant consideration to play over Patrick Nemeth and now good enough to hold off Zach Jones, or, or pretend, we don't know how it's going to shake out. Maybe Zach Jones or Matthew Robertson ends up being the sixth defenseman on opening night. But right now, I mean, the way they're lining up at these practices, it would seem like Libor Hayek might have the inside track to being that sixth defenseman. And again, not good enough to warrant consideration to dress over Patrick Nemeth. A couple months later, now all of a sudden, he's good enough to hold off both Zach Jones and Matthew Robertson to very promising prospects for the Rangers. Of course, Zach Jones has played 22 NHL games and I think has done fairly well for himself in that time. And you know what? Hey, maybe maybe Libor Hayek, maybe he goes out there and kills it this year. Maybe he ends up having a much better season than we think he's going to have. And we all have to eat a lot of crow if that happens. But I don't know, man. I mean, I've watched Libor Hayek. You guys have watched Libor Hayek. I've never really seen anything all that special. And I've never really seen him play well enough to warrant uh, him getting another chance here, 95 career NHL games, and to warrant him getting yet another opportunity here over, once again, Bo Zach Jones and Matthew Robertson. 95 games, it's not a ton, but it's certainly enough to show what you can do at the NHL level. And I just like the idea of somebody else getting an opportunity. Libor Hack has not done enough in those 95 games, at least in my very humble opinion, to warrant having the inside track over two very promising prospects in Jones and in Robertson. We'll see how the whole thing shakes out. Of course, you know, Hayek could start the season as the sixth defenseman. Maybe at a certain point they make a change. Robertson gets a chance. Jones gets a chance. We'll see. I mean, I've, look, and there's six preseason games in front of us as well. So these guys will determine uh, who should be the sixth man by themselves. Obviously, your stock can go up or down depending on how you play in the preseason. Uh, but this is what Gerard Gallant had to say about Libor Hayek. He skates well. He looks strong. He looks more confident this year. He tested really well, so everything's good. Everything's leading to this guy being a good player on our hockey team. So Gallant seems at least somewhat bullish on Libor Hayek, and you know, again, I think we owe it to him to give him at least a little bit of a chance here. I suppose he deserves a chance to 
you know, compete for a job just like everybody else. But to me, the, the much more exciting, much more interesting, and probably just the better options are Zach Jones and or Matthew Robertson. Uh, as far as other, you know, highlights from Friday here, we had Will Cooley scoring a goal against Igor Shesterkin. So that's obviously a nice moment for him as he continues his seemingly uphill battle to try to make this team. Uh, apparently, Friday was also uh, a strong day for the kid line. They were reportedly creating a lot of scoring opportunities pretty much on every shift. Uh, we also had Braden Schneider scoring an overtime goal with a wrist shot from the slot area. Apparently, it caught a little piece of the crossbar, went down and into the net. And uh, it's interesting with Schneider, too, because Gerard Gallant has said he, he's you know, plainly stated that Braden Schneider is going to be on this team. He's already made this team. He doesn't have to, you know, quote unquote, remake the Rangers. You know, he's already here. But Schneider has been refusing to acknowledge that. He is living in a hotel right now for the time being. And this is what Schneider had to say about the whole situation. I don't think anything's secured until my name is called for that. And you love to hear that kind of stuff. Even after his coach says, yes, he will be on the team. He's going to be here. He's going to be out there on opening night. Braden Schneider refuses to take anything for granted and is looking to prove himself all over again, despite a very solid showing for himself in his rookie season and in the playoffs as well this past season. And uh, we're going to continue talking about a couple more scrimmage notes as well as what to expect from the preseason opener against the Islanders. And we will do all that in just a second. All right, a couple more notes from uh, training camp here. This is something that was happening on Friday, and then we'll kind of turn our attention to Saturday and Sunday as well, and just some of the bigger talking points that come out of uh, each session. But on Friday, apparently, and I, I believe this continued throughout the entire you know three days here that we've been discussing here, but apparently uh, Chris Kreider, when the Rangers had an offensive zone faceoff on the left side, he was taking the faceoffs, and then Mika would take the faceoffs uh, whenever there was a draw on the right side, which is very interesting to think about. Of course, part of the reason for it is that Kreider's a lefty and Mika's a righty, so that obviously has something to do with it. But I also just wanted to go back and look at their faceoff numbers from this past season. Uh, Mika Zibanejad won 52.3% of his draws this past season. That is the best mark of his career after three straight seasons under 50%. And I wanted to see, because I, I did seem to remember Kreider uh, taking a few more faceoffs last season than usual, and that indeed was the case. Uh, Chris Kreider took a career-high 137 faceoffs this past season. He went 67 and 70. That is a success rate of 48.9%. Of course, some of those faceoffs are the result of, you know, Mika getting kicked out of the faceoff circle, or if Kreider's out there with a different center, somebody getting kicked out of the circle and he has to step in. But, you know, obviously 137 faceoffs for Kreider, not all of them were because of that. So, it was interesting to see Kreider mix in on the dot a little bit more uh, this past season and maybe more of the same this upcoming season as well. Sounds like uh, if, you know, it, they might just be experimenting with things, but it also seems possible that, you know, Kreider could end up taking a couple of offensive zone draws depending on which side of the uh, the, the rink that the faceoff is going to be happening on. And Kreider in his career, just 43.8% success rate on the faceoff circle. But like I said, a career best, 48.9% uh, last season. I'm not going to include a season where he went 5-1 and one on the circle or 5-4 and four on the circle. You get the idea. That was his best faceoff season of his career when he actually took, uh, you know, a fairly significant amount of faceoffs. So that was kind of interesting to note, you know, Chris Kreider mixing in on the faceoff circle a little bit more often. Uh, on Saturday... Uh, Will Cooley and Jacob Truba, apparently they had some uh, good physical play against one another. And I mean, if you're Will Cooley and you want to stand out and you're looking to mix it up with somebody, Jacob Truba is a, a heck of a, an opponent to go up against because obviously Truba plays, you know, very physical old school style of hockey. And it sounds like there were a couple of good board battles between the two of them. And uh, Will Cooley, you know, tend to hold his own with Truba more often than not when those two were mixing it up a little bit. Uh, something else of note on Saturday, you had Dryden Hunt scoring the first goal of the scrimmage which cannot possibly hurt his cause as it pertains to him potentially being out there on opening night. I still think he's going to be on the outside looking in as far as the opening night roster, but we'll see. Very possible that Dryden Hunt ends up back with the Rangers as kind of the de facto 13th forward, and you know maybe he subs in on certain nights, and other nights he's a healthy scratch. Uh, we also had Capo Caco scoring a goal on a rush. Uh, looked very decisive here. There was a video of it posted. And uh, that's what we need from Kako, more decisiveness and uh, more of a willingness to go to the net. Uh, Lafreniere later scored a tap-in goal, so a good scrimmage for the kid line to be sure. You had Vincent Trocek dominating on the face-off circle, which is very nice to hear as well. Uh, Trocek also scored a goal. And 
This, I'm calling it right now, the Rangers, you know, we're going to do predictions maybe a little bit later in the preseason here, probably right before the regular season starts, but the Rangers, for the first time since I think it's 2007, 2008, I know it's been a really long time, it's somewhere around there in that ballpark, the Rangers will be over 50% on the face-off circle. They simply have too many good face-off guys for that not to be the case. I think they finally uh, break that, that streak of being under 50% for, you know, 15 years or however long it's been at this point. Uh, Gerard Gallant, this was interesting as well. He also mentioned that some of the younger Ranger forwards are going to get a look on the penalty kill. Obviously, the Rangers lost some penalty killers to free agency this past offseason. Uh, Kevin Rooney certainly comes to mind. You got the rentals like Andrew Kopp and Tyler Mott. They're both gone. And, uh, you know, Ryan Strom did a little bit of penalty killing. I guess if you want to include Greg McKaig, he did some penalty killing whenever he actually dressed. So they lost some guys. And uh, it sounds like Kako and Lafreniere both going to get a look on the penalty kill. Now, they tried this a little bit last season in the preseason, and as well as uh, the early parts of the regular season, I believe. I didn't think it really went that well. Uh, Lafreniere and Kako, particularly, just didn't look all that comfortable to me as part of the PK and just kind of looked out of their element. I don't think it's something that, you know, either of them have done all that often. Uh, I don't know that for sure. You know, I'd have to go back and, you know, trace every team that they've ever played for and, you know, see how much time they played for on the penalty kill. But yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I mean, it certainly can't hurt to get them a little bit of experience and put them in a position where they can step in on the penalty kill if they need to. But the Rangers, despite losing a lot of good penalty killers, they still have a lot of good penalty killers. You've got Mika, you've got Kreider, uh, certainly Barclay Goodrow, uh, Trocek now, got to figure he's going to be out there on the penalty kill. Uh, Carpenter for sure, he'll be out there. If Jimmy Vesey, if he's in the lineup, he can kill penalties. So they've got some good options, once again, despite the free agent losses. But hey, it's training camp. It's the preseason. It's time to experiment, mess around with some things, see what sticks. And uh, I do like the idea of Kako and Lafreniere at least getting a look on the PK. And maybe they can help in that department, uh, especially if the Rangers are in a pinch, if there's injuries or whatever it might be, and they need to step in there. Uh, it'd be a good thing if they are able to do so. On Sunday, some interesting line combinations. We had Panarin, Trocek, and Lafreniere. And we also had VZ. Hedl and Kraftsoff. So Lafreniere getting a chance with the Panarin line and uh, the VZ Hedl Kraftsoff line. At least if you go by the early line combinations, that's you know a different player from every line combination. And you know VZ, honestly, I didn't even have him in the top twelve. You know going into the season here, I, I think he could end up being you know a healthy scratch type of a player if he ends up making the team. But uh, yeah, kind of interesting, VZ, Hedl, and Krasov all together. And we finally, Ranger fans will love this. I think the, mo the majority of Ranger fans will enjoy hearing this. We got Zach Jones and Brian Schneider playing together on Sunday scrimmage. So Zach Jones obviously has his name in the hat as far as that sixth and final defense and spot is concerned. And, you know, game on. It's We talked about Libor Hayek earlier. I'd love it to be Zach Jones or Matthew Robertson. But it's good to know that, you know, Jones here playing with Schneider would seem that he's at least going to get a shot at it. Uh, we talked in our last episode about the top nine. It's looking like the fourth line on opening night will probably be Barkley Goodrow, uh, Ryan Carpenter, and Ryan Reeves. And, you know, there's other guys that certainly are in the mix there, but, you know, that's kind of the prevailing thought from people that are covering this team and that are there, you know, watching all these uh, these scrimmages and these training camp sessions. Uh, Gerard Gallant had this to say regarding Ryan Reeves. I'm not going to say he's playing every night, but when we make our lineup and look at our team in the summertime, he's an important guy for us. And I would agree. I think there were some Ranger fans that kind of were a little bit harsh on Ryan Reeves, and he had a couple rough games in the playoffs, to be sure. But Ryan Reeves gave this team a lot of personality. He gave this team a lot of swagger. I think he played that big brother role to a T because he's, you know, by far the oldest guy in the locker room. I mean, now Yaroslav Halak is there, but he's, he's a goalie. You know, Ryan Reeves last season... I believe he was the oldest player by at least four years, so uh, I thought he did a nice job. You know, he, he always does that pregame, the release us thing. I think his teammates really like him, and, uh, and despite him not getting into a lot of fights last season, I, I think his presence really does make a difference at times for this Ranger team. I know some people wanted to trade him and re-sign Tyler Mott, and I would not have argued with that at all. Mott was awesome, but I'm happy that Ryan Reeves is back. I mean, you know, you can't have everything, and... Uh, you know, Reeves, I, I do think, played a, a good role for this team this past season, and hopefully will continue to do so this season whenever he's in the lineup. And speaking of the lineup, we've got a Ranger lineup, or a probable lineup, for Monday night's game, tonight's game against the New York Islanders. You've got a top line of Mika Zibanejad centering Chris Kreider on the left wing, Capo Caco on the right wing, which is kind of interesting. You would think maybe they would put Blay out there because, you know, that's what they've been going with in training camp, and uh, we'll see, though. You know, obviously, they've they've got some time to experiment with some things, and we're going uh, Mika at center, Kreider at left wing, Kako on the right wing for the top line. The second line, 
Filipino centering Jimmy Vesey on the left wing, Vitaly Krausov on the right wing. That's that line I was just talking about a second ago. Uh, the third line, you've got Ryan Carpenter centering Bobby Trevino on the left wing, Ryan Reeves on the right wing. And then the fourth line is very intriguing as well. You've got Gustav Riedal, who the Rangers picked up from the SHL this past offseason. He signs a one-year deal with the team. He centers Brandon Othman on his left wing. Othman obviously has an uphill battle to make this team, but hey, that starts tonight. I mean, that this is when it really starts. I mean, yeah, he's showed pretty well for himself in the training camp, but now he's got some game action in Madison Square Garden. Very, very much looking forward to seeing what he can do and if he can beat the odds and maybe even make this Ranger team. I, I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, never say never. You know, the Rangers have surprised us in the past. So you've got, once again, Riedel at center, uh, Offman at left wing, and then Adam Sakura at right wing. Sakura, of course, was the uh, Rangers' first pick this this past year in the draft. They took him in the second round because they didn't have a first rounder. But obviously, you know, Offman and Sakura, very high draft picks, very much looking forward to seeing what they can do, hoping that they get, you know, a good amount of ice time. We shall see. As far as the defense bearings, you've got Keandre Miller and Jacob Truba. No surprise there. They were together all of this past season, obviously played very well together. Then the second pairing, you've got Zach Jones and Braden Schneider. Once again, I know a lot of Ranger fans are going to appreciate the fact that Jones is getting an opportunity to play with Schneider. And then the third pairing, you've got Libor Hayek playing with Andy Walensky. And uh, we'll see, you know, maybe it's a positive sign for people that want Jones out there that he's with Schneider and Hayek is not. We'll see how the whole thing shakes out. Very much going to be keeping an eye on Jones and Hayek because right now it seems like they're kind of the two leaders as far as that sixth and final defenseman spot is concerned with Matthew Robertson also, you know, probably getting some uh, some consideration as well. And uh, I figure we can wrap up today just by reminding everybody that we, the Fantasy League has been finalized. Everybody that got in, you know, welcome to the league. Anybody that didn't get in, I'm, I'm sorry. I did everything I could. I would love to be able to make it more than a 20-person league, but that's where ESPN kind of caps the whole thing. And, um, you know, next year, we're going to do it the same way. If you played this year, you'll have first crack at reclaiming your spot. If you didn't play this year, then it's first come, first serve. And as soon as I make the announcement next year, email me, and we'll get you in there or do everything we can to get you in there. Um, but yeah, the fantasy draft is going to be this Sunday, October 2nd at 8.30 p.m. Uh, I don't think I'm going to change that. It's definitely going to be Sunday because I want to get it done before you know the season starts. And you know Sunday night, people tend not to be too busy. So I think that'll be pretty good. Uh, but that will pretty much do it for today, guys. Once again, if you'd like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, it is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. And definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that is at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to the Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you next time. Thanks for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. In our next episode, we'll be talking about whatever happens between the Rangers and the Islanders in Monday night's preseason opener. Now make your second listen, Locked On NHL. Locked On experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. Stay up to date on everything in the hockey world. Locked On NHL, your daily 30-minute NHL podcast.